bone or transplant from siblings or full match to those or who are only haplo match. And also I will talk about the presence and absence of donor specific antibodies uh, in haplo bone marrow transplantation. So as we all know, the HLA, which stands for human leukocyte antigen, it is encoded by uh, genes in the short arm of chromosome 6 and in, divided into two classes, class 1 and class 2, that it is immunologically or clinically important for transplantation. In class 1, we have HLA, A, B, and C, and in class 2, D, R, D, Q, and D, P. And we have just to remember that they are located in small area of chromosome 6. So when we talk now about inheritance being in a small area, they travel together. So if we imagine this is a family where the father has two chromosome 6, we will refer to them A and B, and the mother C and D. So each of the siblings, they will get one full chromosome. We don't refer to as chromosome in the HLA laboratory, we refer to as haplotype. So for example, if we imagine here is the patient and he inherited A haplotype from father and C haplotype of the mother, and we type the rest of the siblings. Here we have sibling number one, two, three, and four. Sibling number one, he is matched with the patient only in A haplotype and mismatch other haplotype. So this is what we refer to as haplomatch. Uh, very similar to C, match with the patient, but mismatch for the A haplotype. Again, this is a haplomatch. Uh, we always wish that all our patients have full match pair, in which we have a donor that is full match, like this example here. A and hear me Harry. it's a stop now we just hear you okay uh, no sound no sound okay now we just hear you but we don't see your screen uh, but i am sharing my screen maybe it's done just to... if you can share with us your screen please i am sharing it let me know once you once you see it uh, Try to share your screen. I am. I am sharing my screen. Can you hear me? I do hear you now, but uh, let me see. 
uh, but we want to hear your screen because we don't hear you well. I can hear you very well. Uh, one second. My apology for the bad internet connection is from my side. Yeah, uh, the screen, your screen is just slow. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Again, uh, sibling number three, he is full match with the patient, and this is the scenario we would love to see for each of our patients, but sometimes, unfortunately, we don't see full match. We see haplo match, and sometimes there is no even haplo match. In this slide now, Uh, here I want to show you what we used to do until recently, uh, how we do type the patient and the family. Once we receive patient sample, we will type them for HLA class 1, A, B, and C low resolution, and last high resolution. For the family members, we will do only class 1, A, B, C low resolution, and we will look if there is HLA class 1 match with the sibling, and in many times we will have more than one. So we'll ask the we will ask the physician yes, exactly. please, to please use please choose one of the HLA class one match sibling. And once they choose, we will do HLA class two. And if they are lucky to be matched, they will proceed to transplantation. So for those patients who does not have HLA class one match, then we we'll go and search for match unrelated in the registries or for the blood if he is a small size or um, we have more than four unit that is suitable for the patient. But recently we moved to next generation sequencing in which we do all of our patients and donors from the very beginning at high resolution for the 11 law side. Uh, why we are doing it? Because uh, workflow is much faster, serving our patients in a better way. Plus, frankly speaking, the cost of HLA typing by NGS is really going down, which enables us to do a high resolution class one and two from the very beginning. The previous protocol was to save money because it was very expensive. Now the price is going down, and plus making only one pipeline make it really cost efficient for us. Uh, the probability of finding a match among siblings, uh, actually it is increasing as the number of siblings in the family increases. And in each time we have 25% chance of having HLA match sibling and 50% chance of having Hablo match sibling. This is an example how we do HLA uh, matching for those who are not very familiar with the uh, how matching it works. This is the HLA typing of the patient for A, B, C, D, R, and D, Q. And here is a particular donor, and this patient is lucky to have a full.
Can you hear me, Fadi? Uh, I hear you, but we need to see your screen. I think the times I don't know for some reason it is connecting. Once you see my screen, please let me know. Go ahead. Can you? Yes. This is an example of how we do HLA matching and still we are doing it annually. So this is a patient and HLA typing of the loci A, B, C, D, R, and D, Q. And this is a full match pair. This is a lucky patient. And sometimes not all the patients as lucky as this patient. So another scenario here. <laughs> Then what we have one antigen mismatch toward GBHD. So the patient here typing different than the donor in DQ0603. So the bone marrow and lymphocyte from the donor will recognize this particular DQ as mismatch, mismatch and might mount an immune response toward GBHD. This is one, one antigen mismatch. And also we can have bidirectional, which means there is one antigen mismatch toward GBHD and one antigen mismatch toward graft rejection. And some patients, unfortunately, they don't have one antigen mismatch. All what they have, what we refer to as haplomatch, which means they are having only one chromosome or haplotype match with the donor. So if we are talking about A, B, C, D, R, D, Q, so total of 10, they are only matched at 50%, which is five out of 10 and it is bidirectional for GBHD and graft rejection. It is very important to understand this slide because we are talking about Hablo match. Most of the talk will be about it. So the likelihood of, found, of finding an HLA match, full match sibling, the chance of finding is 30%, actually 30% in the West. In our Arab community, we size the probability of finding a match is much higher. It is around 60 to 70 percent. Although we feel that we need to do a, a new study because the size now is shrinking. So we we think it is now is really less than 70 percent the chance of finding match sibling. For match unrelated, uh, it, the range is from 16 to 75 percent. It depends on the ethnic background of the patient and donor. And the chance of finding HLA haplo identical related 95%. That could be parents, siblings, children, and in some centers they go further to second degree related. So each person have an average of around three potential donors that are haplo matched. Uh, an important slide to know the level of matching, it depends on the center and their protocol of HLA typing and matching. If you hear they are talking about eight out of eight, then they refer to matching or testing for A, B, C, W, and D, R. When they talk 10 out of 10, they add DQ to the group. When they talk about 12 out of 12, they add DP. And all they are important in a way or other. So now when we talk about the impact of HLA matching in allogenic metabolic stem cell transplantation, this is an elegant study done by Lee in 2007, but still very un informative and important, in which they show the level of HLA matching and patient survival over time. The best patient survival can be seen when you have eight out of eight HLA matched, and if you have seven out of eight matched, or six, for each antigen mismatch, you are reducing the 
patient survival by around 10%. This is if you are at the early disease stage. If you wait for a better period, or if you wait for a better donor, the patient might move from being an early disease stage to intermediate, and the value of matching will be decreased. If you wait even more, the value of HLA matching will be diminished. So it is very important if you don't have a match to see what is best available at the moment and go ahead and transplant the patient. Uh, now with the era of HABLO transplantation uh, with the post-transplant cyclophosphamide, back to the HLA matching, HABLO HLA matching. This is a patient I showed you earlier. This is a particular donor that he is a match. Again, five out of 10 match. We have another donor for the same patient, but he is not five out of 10 mismatch. He is only three out of five match. And another donor who is only two antigen mismatch. So he is not just haplo, he is more than haplo match. Now the question, which one we would choose? With our previous perspective, we will look for more matching because more matching better survival and less challenges. But in fact, with HABLU transplantation, with both transplant cyclophosphamide, it is not the case, as I will show you shortly. This is a particular study in which they compare the level of matching among HABLU those who are zero to two antigen mismatch compared to those who are three out of four, three to four antigen mismatch. Again, this is within half low. It is not out of 10, no, out of four. So if you have mismatch, two, zero to two out of four or three to four out of four, as you can see here for patient survival, event of free survival and time was transplant, there is no difference between them. There is no statistical difference between them. And this is also seen with regard to relapse all or non-relapse mortality. So both of them, the relapse or non-relapse mortality, there is no statistical difference between having more matching in HABLU transplantation. And this is also, also applicable to the acute GVHD, which means if you have just have no match, that's good enough. You don't have to have more uh, matching. Or don't feel that the outcome will be less if it is more mismatching within half loop. Another study showing the same result here when you have zero to three or four or five. So this is out of 10. And again, with regard to relapse or acute GBHD or an overall survival, there is no statistical difference between more matching with haplo. So more mismatch within the haplo, still the result is comparable. Uh, one more study here in which they look for the overall survival. And here they mention for low mismatch and high mismatch. Low mismatch, which means zero to two, high mismatch, three to four. Again, for overall survival, there is no difference non relapse mortality, there is no statistical difference for acute as well as chronic GBHD. There was no difference between them. And that was also absorbed with regard to relapse. The relapse uh, event, it is not different whether you have low mismatch level or high mismatch level within the half blood transplant. Uh, this is by the same author here, very elegant study in which they compare the clinical outcome by the donor type. Here we have, here we have haplo transplantation, umbilical cord blood, mismatch donor, mud match, and sibling. Here, the main things to look at is days to engraftment, days to acute GBHD, and the number of CD4 count on day 100. As you can see, if you look here, the extremes between haplo and sibling, the result is very comparable. For days to engraftment, you have here 18, 18, 22 for GBHD here, maybe even better, 32. And the 
increase in CD4 count is very similar between sibling and Havel, which is very encouraging, and maybe this is one of many reasons and many studies which encourage people to go for Havel whenever there is no full match sibling. Uh, one major challenge when we do transplantation uh, with mismatch, uh, especially in haplo, is the presence of donor-specific antibodies. What I mean by donor-specific antibodies, that means the patient is sensitized and he has anti-HLA antibodies in his circulation. You have to make sure that none of these antibodies specificities against the mismatch of the engrafted marrow or stem cell. So if you have DSA and it is of higher higher titer, there is increased percentage of graft failure and increased probability of transplant related mortality and also reduction in survival. Again, this can be seen whenever we do transplant with mismatch. Where these antibodies and anti HLA antibody comes from? It comes from Patient receive, receiving blood or blood product transfusions, uh, as you know, many of the patients with malignant diseases, hematological diseases, they are um, transfusion dependent, which means they get always blood transfusion, which means they are exposed to blood product, which means exposed to foreign HLA molecules that they don't own, so they develop antibodies uh, with time, and the titer will be stronger with the repeat of the challenge. And also multi, multiple pregnancies, as we all know, it is a source of sensitization since the fetus carry half of the HLA antigenes that is foreign to the mother, and the mother will develop anti-HLA antibody. And another source of sensitization is previous transplantation, infection, and vaccination. So again, it is very important that those with antibodies in half low transplant also for the blood transplant because most of the cases we are dealing with mismatch and also mismatch and related donor we have to make sure there is no antibody against the mismatch present mismatch related donor and also which i find sometimes people they forget even if you are transplanting with matched and related donor you have to make sure you are typing for all loci that is important like dp which means you have to win 12 out of 12. when you need to do dp if the patient is sensitized and he has anti-dp antibodies you have to make sure that this specificity particular specificity is not mismatched with the donor otherwise it will be a challenge and you might lose your graph uh, DP, if you have a full match, match unrelated donor, there is weak linkage disequilibrium with DP, which means uh, that you will find A, B, C, D, R, D, Q match, but DP mismatched, and the percentage could be as high as 70% match in everything except DP. So please make sure if the patient is sensitized in class 2 with DP antibody, make sure that the patient and donor match for DP, or at least the patient does not carry anti-HLA antibody that's DP specific. Uh, this is showing the seriousness of presence of donor-specific antibody and the drug failure. If you have antibodies against class 1, the odd ratio is 11%. If you have class two, 12%. If you have antibody that is DSA for class one and class two, there is a chance of 22 higher that you will re, you will have a drop rejection. So it is really a serious issue. We have to make sure that there is no DSA. Or if there's DSA, we have to be aware and treat it before we transplant. Uh, this is an elegant study in which they compare the transplant related mortality over time with uh, presence of donor specific antibodies and they divide it into those patients who has donor specific antibody more than 10,000 MFI and to those who are less than 2,000 and the group in between. As you can see here, 
those who had donor specific antibody with high MFI, the mortality rate is much, much higher than those with lower uh, DSA MFI. This is seen in transplant related mortality and also in survival. The worst patient survival or overall survival can be seen with higher uh, MFI donor specific antibody. I'm sorry, Tim, I have technical challenge again. Uh, another study here in which they look for presence of donor specific antibodies compared to those who are uh, not DSA plus those who are with DSA. So those with DSA, the survival age is really very low compared to those who are with no DSA, the B value is very significant. And also transplant related mortality. Those with DSA much higher than those without DSA. And in this study, they further dissect the DSA into those who are C1Q negative and C1Q positive. And as you can see here, uh, those who are C1Q positive donor specific antibodies they have lower overall survival and the c1q negative here is cut short maybe because of the number of patients is very low but it is well documented if you have c1q positive that it is inferior uh, sorry for that uh, another study here showing it uh, showing it clearly the Sierra team from MD Anderson in which they look at the DSA effect on engraftment. Here DSA negative, DSA positive, the probability of engraftment much less compared to those who are with no DSA and they break it down to C1Q negative and C1Q positive. As you can see, huge difference between those who are C1Q positive, the probability of engraftment is really low, especially maybe with MD Anderson where they have very active desensitization program for ablo transplant, uh, compared to those who are C1Q negative. So it is really a major risk to have a patient who is sensitized with DSA that is C1Q positive. Actually, we are using uh, the MD Anderson protocol for the sensitization in our patients. Uh, this is a case at our institution here, transplanted recently. Uh, this is the HLA typing of the patient. And here, the HLA typing of the donor. This is the best donor. The patient has several donors, but we looked at the best available donor from HLA perspective in which there is tableau match and the lowest number of donor specific antibodies with the lowest total cumulative MFI. And for this particular patient still, the best we can find is with the three donor specific antibodies. Again, the patient is haplo, full haplo match only, and the three DSA. And the MFI of the DSA, uh, 6,800 for C, and for DR15, it is 9,400, and for DQ6, uh, around 12,000. Luckily, this patient, all of his DSA, they were C1Q negative. Uh, and also we did, sorry, also we did the flow cross match and it was from positive 40, 280 for channel shift and for the B, it was 450. We will be very worried and more concerned if it was C1Q positive, but luckily it was C1Q negative. Uh, back of what we are doing in our institution, uh, uh, we are looking for HABLU identical donor selection. Uh, we look for HABLU match. And if there is DSA positive, we would love to have, of course, DSA negative. But if DSA positive, we look for alternative donors. If there is alternative donor that DSA negative, that's really what we hope. 
But if there is no other option, no alternative donors, then we look at the number of donors specific antibody and their MFI. We choose the donor that he is with least DSA, with least cumulative uh, MFI. Also, we prefer that he is C1Q negative to that particular mismatch. We do flow cross match to see how strong the binding between the antibody and the target cell. And also very useful to do CDC cross match, which is in a way you are confirming your C1Q positivity. If it is negative, then you should have CDC cross match negative. But this answer you will not get from low cross match because of low cross match, it will give you positive cross match, whether it is complement fixing or non complement fixing. If you end up with the best available of your donors and still there is DSA with high MFI, then you have to desensitize. And there is several protocol, protocols for desensitization. The one we are using in our distribution again is the one used by the MD Anderson team in which they use Rituximab, IVIG, plasma phoresis, and Buffy core. Uh, this is what being used now. We hope that IDIS at one point will be introduced and it will make it faster and easier for the patient. But as, as, I, as far as I know, it is not uh, uh, widely used. For those patients other than the HLA, uh, gender uh, preferred to use male than female, relationship, uh, there is also preferences that you use uh, children, then sibling, then father, then the mother. Uh, all of this is observational result that they compare the outcome and they found uh, the preferred is children, then sibling, father, mother is the last. And age-wise, in general, younger is better. NEMA always preferred compared to NEPA. Uh, whenever you have a chance to have NEMA mismatch, you go for NEMA mismatch. And also, CMV, it's better to match the patient and the, order and the donor for C CMV status just to avoid reactivation of uh, the virus. Uh, so just to summarize that the degree of efficacy, if you are more than <coughs> has a negative effect and actually antibody characterization and monitoring uh, before and after transplantation is very essential. Uh, if DSA is present, altern alternative donor uh, should be pursued whenever possible. If you have no choice, then you have to desensitize to make sure to overcome the DSA challenge. But very important is the communication between the laboratory and the clinic. Uh, whenever we have a scenario in our uh, institution, we are in close contact with the attending physician to make sure that he has clear plan with full information from our side. Uh, so far in, in, in our institution, we did around 90 uh, have local model transplant and around 10 that need desensitization. And luckily we are very successful with desensitization in our patients. And with this, I will thank you for your time and attention and I will come any question you have. Uh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muhib, for this elegant talk. Uh, will uh, you cover it pretty widely? Uh, now we'll go to the questions and discussions. So I'm encouraging everyone to uh, please uh, speak up and share with us uh, uh, any question and discussion. Maybe also here is uh, Sally with us also would like to share something. Uh, thank you, Dr. Muhib, very much for this uh, elegant talk. Uh, very nice and uh, very well uh, presented. Uh, I just want to ask you if uh, uh, to, you know, to accommodate our uh, protocol, if, if, we don't, if we don't want to do the C1Q, we can do the, according to the algorithm you have presented, we can do CDC cross match uh, instead of the flow cross match and C1Q cross match. Would it the, C, uh, the CDC cross match uh, be uh, an alternative for those two uh, uh, techniques? I think the, C, the CDC cross match is very valuable for those who are not capable of doing C1EQ. I think it is very valid 
way of doing it. Um, I would love to have both, but actually we just dropped the CDC cross match recently because of the VT challenge, uh, uh, having uh, cells uh, alive from the US and all the distance. But yes, in my opinion, you can do CDC cross match. If it is well controlled, I think it is really trustworthy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Dr. Muhib, here is a question from Dr. Aziz. Uh, he said to you, uh, nice talk, Muhib. Uh, did NGS improve haploidentical transplant outcome compared with the Sanger or give the same results? Uh, very good question, Dr. Aziz. Uh, actually, we are in the process to look at our data with Dr. Riyad Fatih, maybe he's attending the presentation. But frankly speaking, I don't think it will play a major role. Uh, whether it is Sanger or uh, uh, NGS, next generation sequencing, that's in my opinion. I don't think it is a major player. Okay, good. Uh, Dr. Ashraf uh, here he would like to uh, comment questions. Please, Dr. Ashraf. Yeah, thank you, uh, Fadi, for the organization and uh, uh, all the RC responsible persons, Dr. Dunya and the others. And thank you, of course, Mohib, for this uh, really very good and nice presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you, Dr. Mohib, regarding the uh, results of the DSA and the haploidentical setting. When you have a positive DSA uh, and positive flow cross match, but negative C1Q and negative CDC cross match results. Uh, do you all go for desynthetization because it is most likely, despite the DSA and the positive cross match, not complement activating antibody? Allahi, it is very beautiful question and uh, <laughs> really important as well. Yes, until now, Dr. Ashraf, despite that this particular patient I showed you, uh, it was C1Q negative, but we went through all the desensitization protocol, including Bofico. Because we are at the stage where, where we are collecting data. We don't want to risk. Okay. Maybe when we look at our data, actually we are in the process of collaborating with the MD Anderson uh, group to have larger volume to look at your, to answer your question, do we need one of the goal would be, do we need to desensitize if, if it is C1 if you negative, CDC cross match negative and spend that much time and money or not? For us, for the safety of the patient, until now we still take the patient for the full journey just to make him on the safe side. We, we have such case and we have uh, risk it. And if I were t about 10,000, 10, I don't remember, but it's what relevant antibody, but it was clear for us that without complement activation. And we don't uh, see any rejection or, or like this. This is uh, so, cell? Yes. Uh, no, no. It was uh, kidney. We don't risk it in stem cell till now, <laughs> like you. <laughs> any question? Any comment, question, please? Uh, We'll see more questions will come up now. I have a question that you usually have difficult ones. <laughs> uh, we we want to give a space and uh, to others. We're going to give chance to everyone here. We have plenty of people. So please uh, share your questions or comments. Uh, would like to see also if any of the attendants, they do have also haplo identical at their center, if they can also share with us their experience, that will be good too. I, I think I have just one comment. Or, Excellent. Or is it an, an inquiry to, to Dr. Muhib? You, you don't, you seem you don't like cure Dr. Muhib or natural killer cell <laughs> mismatching for AML. You, you haven't even, Put the, the initials in the <laughs> in the presentation. Um, uh, here is also one of the factors that is being looked at for haplo and being used. But but 
not by all the centers. For some reason, some centers, they still feel that it is not all agree on the value of doing here. Yes, some people, they, you know, uh, they feel strongly that it is very important and make a difference. Some other people know. Uh, actually, from time to time, we visit with our senior consultants and we want to start serving uh, our patient with hair matching and uh, the last time which was almost a year they said if it is not expensive we will do it so i said no that we would not go and do it because it is not expensive we want to do it if we feel we uh, will have a benefit for the patient but until now we did not convince them that it is of a big value that it should not be left but i agree with you and uh, like uh, our colleague uh, Raja from San Francisco, if you maybe say, say that here is not important, he will feel really disappointed and many others as well. But till now in our institution, we are not doing it. Uh, I hope in the near future we will be doing it. Yes, many people, they think it is of a big value to be included and have to match. Well, I, I think it is it's it's it, yani it's uh, its importance was highlighted or or no controversy on its importance in acute myeloid leukemia any other diagnosis it was debatable however in acute myeloid leukemia it's the the one diagnosis that stands among all others that can benefit from this mismatch or key mismatch i agree with you 100 uh here there is a question, question from Ms. Huda. Is there any difference between the outcome of the transplant if the primary disease is benign or malignant? Because they did not specify this in their study. This is a really good question. Most of what I came across is malignant. If you look at primary immune deficiency, I haven't seen it, to be honest. They look at a particular, other than aplastic anemia. Other than that, I haven't seen it. I think with time we will see more specified uh, research paper tackling certain diseases and comparing the outcome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there is another question here also. Uh, is there any difference in the transplantation outcome between full antigen match antigen but hablo mismatch versus full antigen match and hablo match as well? Uh, this is a question from Mr. Murad. Uh, according to my own uh, education, no. Now, in fact, uh, Aditi Murad, uh, I miss you. <laughs> some people, they think having a mismatch in HAPL, like in DR, in some studies, they, they found out that the overall survival is better when you have DR mismatch. Some other studies, they look when there is DP mismatch, there is better rate of lower relapse mismatch because there will be graft versus leukemia. So now more toward, we move from whether it is visible to do HAPLO, a level where HAPLO is comparable, and I won't be surprised in the near future that HAPLO is superior. So we have to wait. Yeah, yes, there are some people, they think it is comparable now, and I won't be surprised that it will be superior. Because it has a lot of uh, other advantages which I didn't talk about here, the availability of the donor and the timing and so on. So yes, uh, it is not inferior by any means. Okay, Sally, you wanna read the next question? I, yes, I think uh, Dr. Shirin Shawi, she wants to uh, ask a question. Uh, yes, uh, yes, please. Yes, uh, Dr. Shireen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohi, for this nice presentation. Um, I, I would like to ask about uh, what is the Buffy coat uh, uh, technique you are using for desensitization? And another thing is the um, what about the minor histocompatibility? Um, uh, rejection or so uh, in this technique in the haplo uh, in the haplo transplant uh, mismatch. 
Thank you. So answer the second question. Definitely, okay. <laughs> definitely there is more and more minor mismatches. Once you have yes. mismatch, the possibility of the minor is there. But as you know, from my experience, at least from in animal models, when you have a major mismatch, the value of minors will be difficult to trace because you have major players taking it over. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to your uh, first question, uh, Buffy code, the importance of the Buffy code, they have to, this Buffy code has to carry the antigen that is mismatched with the patient. So the point is to absorb what is in the circulation in the antibody by the Buffy code. Okay. Okay. I can share with you uh, the protocol we are using from MD Anderson if you are interested. Yes, please. I would, I would love it. Thank you very much. Thank you for such a great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Sally, go ahead. We're international. Hmm? Uh, there is here a question. I think uh, also I would like to know if haploidentical transplants from parents have the same chance of success compared to siblings. Uh, what is more the direction is or the observation of results show that the best can be seen with children, then siblings, then father, then mother. This is the sequence. Some you might ask some in some scenarios we have explanation and some in my opinion, they are observational. What I mean by observational, they look at number of transplant done for children, number of transplant done for mother and father and siblings with very similar conditions and see the outcome, survivor, relapse, uh, and so on, and see which one better. Now, children, uh, siblings, father, and mother. Uh, okay, uh, there might be here also some questions. Uh, Dr. Rabab, I think yeah, go ahead. you want to... Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Thank you, Dr. Mohi, for this nice presentation. Uh, I just added a comment. I mean, of course, when, the, when we compare the haploidentical to full match siblings, actually full match sibling or one allele mismatch, they have comparable results. However, the power of the uh, haploidentical came from, as Dr. Mohib said, availability of the, of the donor. Uh, any patient is potentially have a haploidentical uh, donor, which uh, as you have seen from the graphs, they save a lot of time of searching for a full match. And uh, earlier the transplantation, uh, the better is the outcome or the, the much effect will be or the impact will be of the HLA typing. That's why it might come that the hablo identical might take over with time. Uh, the power actually of the hablo identical is the exertion of the graft versus leukemia, which is the main reasons of the uh, transplantation because you are very much rely on the engrafted cells to uh, get rid of the leukemic cells. So you give less as in uh, cytotoxic or conditioning regimens. Why the uh, haploidentical sibling? It is because uh, the uh, engraftment very much uh, uh, impacted by the thymopoiesis because the T cells engraftment from the beginning is whatever is coming from the graft. However, most of the part of T cell engraftment will come from the new thymopoiesis. As you know, the thymic uh, gland uh, involuted with, with, with age. So the younger the donor, the higher the potential for the thymic, uh, early thymic immigrants to proliferate and give rapid uh, engraftment. Uh, and consequently, the uh, powerful effect of GVL. And that's why the younger haploidentical, which are mainly the children, are better source because you give young uh, prethymic uh, or prethymoplast that is going to be engrafted quickly 
uh, and uh, exerting the graft versus leukemia. Uh, now, provided the parents, and the parents usually, they are elderly. However, younger parents who is less than uh, like 35 will have a comparable results with the, with the children. So the younger the parents will be equal or equivalent to uh, a sibling. And older parents may have poor prognosis. Of course, why the father more than the mother is better than the mother? Because the mother very likely to have uh, antibodies in her serum and a passive transfer of antibody in this time. And uh, you might get rejection. But that's why it is in that sequence. You have uh, children uh, or siblings. Uh, furthermore, it might this a child or the sibling might have anemia uh, mismatch and in this case uh, it will be more or less comparable to uh, a fully matched siblings uh, unless you want to exert a GVL effect uh, and then the parents because they have older uh, thymic uh, progenitor cells and with the parents, uh, you have the father better than the mother because of the antibodies. That was uh, my comment. Thank you. Excellent comment. Thank you, Dr. Arabab. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Arabab, for uh, the nice comment. Uh, uh, we ha don't have uh, any questions right now. I think, uh, I think there is one question, Sally. I just read it here. I think it was sent to me maybe private but I will share it with you. <laughs> uh, on the private, I will, I will not see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me see. I will. This is the questions. Uh, I need to read it uh, uh, to Dr. Muhib. Okay, here is the question. In your 90 haplo patients with 10 desensitized, what is the rate success between the 80 haplo without desensitization and with desensitization? Carla Fadi, you have to get her or his name and we will share the results soon once it is done. We are in the process of evaluating uh, uh, our outcome with the Kuriyat Maki. He's in charge of it, consultant from the third of this. I think we have another question from uh, Dr. Rania Bakri. You can go ahead, Dr. Rania. She said, I have a question. Yeah, Dr. Please. Rania. Go ahead, Dr. Rania. Go ahead. Okay. Dr. Aranya? Okay, it's now. Hello. Aywa. Go ahead, Dr. Aranya. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohib, for uh, this uh, very update, informative talk. Thank you. Uh, actually, in, uh, in our institutes, up till now, we, uh, we are doing uh, only uh, autologous and uh, uh, matched uh, sibling uh, transplantation. Mm -hmm. Up till now, we uh, we we didn't start in uh, haploidentical. Uh, we always uh, we always do, um, doing uh, for Lucas. We didn't uh, we didn't make DPP. Uh, so it's amazing uh, to hear uh, that you uh, commented here. Uh, we must be pay attention to uh, the mismatch for, for DPP uh, as a linkage linkage to this equilibrium. Uh, can you uh, can you clarify this point, please, Dr. Muni? Thank you. So when you transplant someone, for example, today we were talking about with Fadi in the laboratory just this morning. We have a patient and the full match donor was his father. That he is matched at A, B, C, D, R, D, Q, but mismatch in DP. So this particular patient, if the father is the only match, we have to make sure he is not sensitized to DP, especially the specificity against the mismatch coming from the father. If he is sensitized against DP, but the specificity of the antibody against DP, not the DP coming from the father, still no problem. But if it is against this particular antigen, which is expressed in the hematopoietic stem cell of the father, then we have to uh, go through the exercise of seeing the, the MFI, C1EQ, cross match, and then if the need for desensitization or not. 
Uh, I think we have another question also. Uh, can you elaborate on the post-transplant cyclophosphamide and tolerance? Um, this is a good question, but maybe beyond my expertise in the HLA lab. But uh, if you are in need, I can uh, connect you with the person who is using it and monitoring it. For me, if I have information, it will be casual, not something you want to use. But I can connect you, or Fadi or the admin can take the contact information. We can connect you to the people who can really give you the correct information. I, I think, uh, uh, any other questions? Before Dr. Muhib uh, finalizes his uh, wonderful uh, talk. Anyone? Last call. Well, uh, I think please. now we have anyone more. We should give uh, Sally. Maybe we should give incentive for asking questions. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 They will be begging us to ask Dr. Muhib for questions. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah. When we give incentives, I will share it with Dr. Muhib. No worry. <laughs> <laughs> At the end, I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to talk about something we are doing in the lab, and I want to thank you for your time and leaving your, uh, you know, family and attending at late night and maybe for other people early morning. And also, I want to apologize for the.